Well, thank you everybody for coming. Welcome to the Bedford Lyceum. It's brought to you by the First Parish Unitarian Universalist here in Massachusetts. The Bedford Lyceum is a community lecture series covering a, a wide variety of topics, from medicine to music, world affairs to financial investment, travel logs to poetry, and all talks are free, open to the public, and pre-registration is not required. This presentation is being recorded and will be uploaded to YouTube next week. For the YouTube link, please feel free to email me, and I'll say this slowly, mountainbreeze52 at gmail.com. <laughs> Otherwise, you can, you can certainly call the the church office. Uh, this afternoon, we're thrilled to have Václav Vlad Shapiro speak to us about the Ukraine and help us better understand the current war in context. Just as a little introduction, Vlad earned his undergraduate degree at Moscow State University and came to the United States in 1991, shortly before the collapse of the Soviet Union as a math graduate student at Brandeis University here in Massachusetts. During the last 20 years, he has been working as an advisor in the cybersecurity field, specifically concentrating on the human factor at Element. Vlad is an author and guest speaker at many prominent conferences in his area of expertise, working with clients around the world. His interests include sports, specifically soccer and basketball, world and Eastern European history and culture, chess and music, and his family moved to Bedford in 2016. Natalia is also here, his wife and fellow mathematician. Thank you very much, and I'll give it to Vlad. Hi, uh, my name is Rich Doherty, and a few weeks ago, Nancy and I were sitting back there, and we heard these calculus ideas and notions flying past our ears, and what, turned around and, what the heck? It was Vlad and Natalia there. <laughs> and we started talking about Ukraine. We were here for a, a Beethoven conference, wasn't it, Vlad? <clears throat> and I asked Vlad, what? We do these things. Would you be interested in coming for a lyceum and talking about Ukraine. Whatever you want to say that you think we need to know. And it can be controversial, and it probably will be. Um, <clears throat> so that's how we made this connection. One other thing I want to say is uh, these lyceums are free. <clears throat> but Nancy and I put together a potato feast after church this morning, and we had this basket selling potatoes. And uh, I looked in here, and there's, there's a $100 bill and several 50s, a whole bunch of 20s. <clears throat> we are not asking you to pay for coming to this Lyceum. But this basket will be outside here for <clears throat> a, funds that will be sent to a student-based organization in Boston. They're <clears throat> graduate students from Ukraine. I talked to a couple of them. They're, they're really cool and done a great job. That's where these funds will go to if you care to make a donation. So far, Vlad may want to uh, update this. They've sent more than $50,000 for humanitarian relief to Ukraine. They're a great organization. They're doing great work, and they would like to have our support. Thanks. It's up to you, Vlad. Go ahead. Thank you. <clears throat> well. Uh, just one other thing, I want to ask those people on Zoom, please thank you very much for joining us. If everyone could just jot down their questions, Vlad is going to be handling questions and answering them on our as best he can after the presentation. There'll be plenty of time for questions and answers, and if those on Zoom can just keep themselves muted until called upon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you, Rich. <clears throat> Again, my name is Vlad Shapiro, and I'm very, very thankful and grateful for you and the group to, be, to have a chance to present about my homeland, about Ukraine, a chance for me, for my wife, for my son. <laughs> We're a whole family here. Um, what I would like to 
do at the beginning before we're going to start <clears throat> talking. This is for me, is just to opening curtain for Americans on Ukraine. The biggest thing I want to get out of this is your questions and your concerns. I'll give you a little bit of a base of what we're going to talk about. Uh, we decided to do it in two weeks because a lot of materials to cover. So I will be watching the clock, doing approximately half an hour, and then we're going to start questioning. Okay? So the, what, the goal of this presentation is to give you an, a little bit of an overview of three important questions. Question number one, what are the real roots of the current war? Question number two, what is Ukraine? I called it Ukraine 101. Okay, you want to know what's really interesting? At Brandeis, there is no classes for 101. There is 11, you know, 14, but anyway. Okay, so, and the third one, which probably going to happen next time, is Ukraine and United States. Historically, yesterday, today, and tomorrow. On a special concentration on tomorrow. Because that's where we're going, right? Good. All right, so. Let's go, uh, hold on a second, let us me start changing the slides. Here we go, so this is basic, you know. What I'm gonna do with slides is mostly informational, okay? I'm not gonna go through every element of the slide, but this is what we're gonna cover today. All of those slides you will receive at the end, the organizers will send you the slides. So, first question. Quick, quick survey of the audience, is it? To, yeah, 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 okay, thank you. Uh, first uh, question to the audience, you don't need a mic for this, but you know, just tell you what you think. What do you think why war is going on right now? What are the guesses? Anybody? Say whatever you think. Why the war is going on right now? Okay, great. Any other sense? Don't be shy. All right. Anybody? Hmm? Okay. All right. So, you. Yeah. Uh, Putin feels threatened by NATO. That's a good one. Yes, that's what Putin said all the time. Correct. What else? Yeah. They want, they want water access to that location. Oh, that's a good one. Timothy Snyder will like you very much. <laughs> Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Anybody else? And I'm going to close the floor. Okay, good. So you know what? <clears throat> All of you just said is something which you heard, you've seen around, you thought about it. And you know what? All of them has some kind of merit. But you know what? Let's go deeper because this is why we're here. And the deeper problem is that you are absolutely correct, but the deeper problem is we have, and you can read it over there, an existential conflict. It's about existence. Existence of Ukraine as an independent country. Now you're gonna ask yourself, why? You know, Russia is huge. It's the biggest country in the area, not area in the region, right? Almost 80% of <clears throat> Russian territory has no population whatsoever. Well, don't tell them the Chinese, you know. They'll take care of that problem. So, why Ukraine? Why keeping Ukraine so much? I want to show you something very interesting. Do you see the little picture down there? Unfortunately, I cannot make it bigger. This picture is what was in our books during all Soviet time, represents 15 people representing 15 Soviet republics. You see that? Now, here's an interesting question for you. Who looks the most serious businesslike? There's a dude in the middle. He has a suit and a tie. He's in charge. He's the boss. Guess what country he represents? Not Kazakhstan, right? No, definitely. On the right side of him, if you're facing him, you will see a nice, beautiful girl who represents Ukraine. On the left side of him is a person who represents Belarus. You see how close their hands are? 
You see what the Russian guy doesn't leave? It let him go completely, like keep him, so they stay there. That is in our heads was put, by that image was everywhere, in the books, in the banners, on the TV, on the radio, everywhere, on the radio too. Okay, what does that represent? It puts them in carving an image for the rest of the world that the Russian guy is in the middle, he's the most important, he is an older brother. And Ukrainians and Belarus people are younger brothers and sisters. And Ukraine is a female, you know, Belarus is male, according to the Russian language, even, by the way, Russia is also female, according to the Russian language. But they never say Russia, they say Russian Republic, or Russian Z, right? Okay? So this is their idea. Guess what happened when one of those, or two, gone? There's a whole gap there, like, what, what do you mean? Like, how the hell they can just get out? Right? What happened? So this is what they're going to lose if Ukraine is not there anymore. They need Ukraine because without the Ukraine, this triad doesn't work anymore. And the older brother theory, which says that, you know, older brother and another one, younger one, they have to listen to him, failed. This is you probably heard, but the second and third and fourth you probably never heard. Second one, during the Tsarist time, the Nicholas I, was a very nice guy, you know, he you know, was one of the probably most stricter military kind of dudes in the country. During him was a coup, they tried to overthrow him, didn't help him, called Dikabristi in December. But this guy's minister of education, just think about it, came up with this idea. The Russian empire is based on three principles, orthodoxy, autocracy, nationality. Okay, nice, right? Pravoslavia. Samodzhavia, narodnost. This is in Russian. Okay? Why those three? Well, it's very simple. The Russian church should be in charge. But not without the Tsar. And autocracy in this particular case is not necessarily means just Tsar. It's the whole pyramid. Whoever, so whatever said on top, go all the way to the bottom. And finally, the nationality, what translates is nationalism. You know? Narodnost in this particular situation is that Narod people will follow the czar, will follow the church, will follow the leaders without even asking any questions. Okay, do you think that when Ukraine secedes, that's going to fit really well with that? Probably not. That destroys that thing too, if Ukraine secedes, if Ukraine will be not under Russian power. Let's go for the third one. The Russian claims that Moscow is the third Rome. It's not a joke. There was a dude named Philophane, right? He was coming up with this great idea that two Romes didn't survive. Rome, what's the second one, guess? Constantinople, right? So the third one showed up, and there will be never the fourth one. For more information, you could go to Timothy Strider lectures. He will explain you why this idea comes from. But this is in the hearts and brains of every person in Russia today. Now, here's a little question for you. What do you think the Christianity came to Russia? From where? From Rus, from Kiev. 1988, the, the Kiev was baptized, Kiev was baptized by the King Volodymyr at that time. So the Russians say, okay, it was in Kiev, then it moved to Moscow. And suddenly Kiev is not even there, like, oh my God, how can we lose control of this thing? Then we lose the whole history. So the whole history is kind of under questions now. Right? Kiev should be under control of Russia, then we will continue to this idea. And finally, the most beautiful one, that the Moscow is a direct ancestor of the Kiev Rus. Well, for that, I would definitely address you to the Timothy Snyder, who was explaining that's not exactly the case. There were three ancestors, even four if you discuss, but I don't want to go into details, but this idea is in, not in the Soviet or Empire. It's in today's head of Russian population. So yes, Putin is the one who started the war. Yes, Putin is running, but that's not him who created this idea. And why Russians continue supporting this idea? Because they absolutely are sure that those four things are true. Okay? And this is why we have this war. Because, you know, without it, don't say. By the way, American interpretation for that. Everybody seen Hamilton? Hamilton? Okay. Just turn the, uh, the sing, it's a song of 
the King Charles, ignore the first three letters, three phrases, and think about Putin instead of King Charles singing it. It will make a lot of sense. Just check it out. Because it ends how? How can you leave me? We love you so much. And by the way, if you leave, we're going to kill you and all of your relatives. Okay? It's moving along. Okay. All right. Okay. Let's do that. All right. Um, existential. Now, the second, the second story, I just want to give you citations. You've seen them probably, right? If you, Russia won't stop fighting, there will be no war. If Ukraine stop fighting, there will be no Ukraine. Just to confirming what we were just discussing. And by the way, New Yorker articles, absolutely beautiful. You can read about it. It's a colonial war, right? So, now let's talk about the differences. Because this is interesting, because we were talking about Russia and Ukraine, and what's the difference, right? First, name. If you ask any Russian person today, what Ukraine name come from? They say, well, it's a borderland, right? Go on Wikipedia and read it. It said borderland. Because Krai in Russian language is a border. Well, yeah, but there are two issues there. Issue number one, in Ukrainian, Kraina means a country, homeland. Okay? And by the way, the letters R-A-I spells a haven in Ukrainian language, which is right in the middle of the name of Ukraine. So we have, and by the way, Ukrainian map of 1648, this is on your slide, created by people from Netherlands. They kind of travel around, they know what they were doing, right, a little bit. You've heard about them, right? No, why I put it 1648? Well, that year has some significance in the history of Ukraine, right? That is the year when the Polish-Ukrainian War happened and when there was an agreement with the Moscovites to fight against Poland. So, at that time, even though the Russian history books will tell you there was no Ukraine, guess what's written on that map? Ukraine. Now let's talk about the language. The biggest misconception on the language is that Russian language is the close, in Ukrainian, is very, very close to Russian. Guess what? It's wrong. You know what language they're closest to? According to the linguist, not me, Serbian and Polish. We can, and people in Ukraine, people from Ukraine who are in this school can tell you that it's very easy for us to create a sentence which Russian-speaking person would never understand a word of it. But Serbians and Poles will, okay? So, why do we think this way? Why? Well, the answer is very simple. Uh, Russian propaganda worked for so many generations to destroy Ukrainian language by prohibiting printing it, say hello to the times of Catherine the Great. Okay, destroying the whole Ukrainian independence, even though it was absolutely agreed upon with the agreement of 96, I mean, 1648, right? Okay, so, you know, Putin doesn't do anything new. He just continues of the tradition of Russia to kind of destroy Ukraine. Like, why they're afraid of it? Now you know, because all of those four things we were discussed before are gonna go to the toilet, basically, right? The next thing is, what you probably don't know, is how much money Russia invested in propagating the Russian culture abroad. Now, you're gonna ask me a question, well, why is it bad? No, it's not bad. But they made sure that the propaganda, that that was the only Slavic language which was prohibited, which was, you know, propagated around the world. Because of what? Because they are who? The older brother. And before you learn about the younger brothers, you need to learn about the older brother. And by the way, check it out. When most of the translations of Russian literature was done, you would be surprised, but it was in 20th century, specifically after the revolution, specifically in 20s and 30s. During that time, a lot of Russian immigrants were where? In America, in Europe. They had no jobs. So the people from, from the Soviet Union came to them with money and said, hey, we can help you out. Just go to the department and say, we have money, we, can, we need to create departments of studying Russian because Russian literature is beautiful. Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, you know that. Music is great, you're all Rachmaninov, you know. Great, nothing wrong with it, right? But slowly but surely, they're going to make sure that there's no other languages. Do you want to check this out? Go to any Boston University except of Harvard. Go to the department who studies Russian language and guess what the name of it is? The Russian and Eastern European Studies. Russian and Slavic Studies. And who runs them? Russians. 
not necessarily Russian Russian, could be American who grew up on, who is the, the you know, had a degree from the same department. And you're going to ask them questions like, uh, can I learn more about Mitskevich, one of the greatest poets in Poland, or Shevchenko, one of the greatest poets in Ukraine, or I don't know, Yaroslav Hasek, for God's sake, right? Do we have a class on it? They say, no, 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 but we have classes on Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, Pushkin, right? And when you propose them to have a class on the other people, the answer will be, we have no money, sorry, we have no people, no money, no, you know, I'm sorry. That's what historically happened, right? Okay, so that is, that is interesting, right? Okay, and another question is how they, they influence the culture. Well, it's very interesting too. Have any of you been in Carnegie Hall? Yes. Do you see the museum of Carnegie Hall? There's a museum there, there is some big room. You know what name is on top of that? You can Google right now if you want. The name of the dude who actually spend millions of dollars on Carnegie Hall is uh, no, you know, a good businessman. On the, you, you understand what I mean by that, right? Like good businessman who did a lot of money with Russia on selling oil and gas and you know, some other little things which usually people don't talk about. Okay? And uh, when um, you know, we tried to fight this, right? We have even a person from Harvard University who tried to fight him. And, you know, they, they no guns anymore, but lawyers, <laughs> they're very powerful too. So, influence of Russian culture everywhere. Why? Well, because we have to make sure that Russian, make sure that Russian literature is right there. And everybody else is, yeah, they exist. They don't deny that there is Ukrainian literature or Polish literature, but yeah, somewhere over there. So, interesting thing is, what's the difference between Ukrainian patriots and, and Russian patriots? The difference is very interesting. Well, in Ukraine, I grew up in the Soviet Union. I'm Jewish. I've seen so much anti-Semitism you would not believe. I came to Ukraine in 2001. I was shocked. Anti-Semitism is gone forever. You have Orthodox Jews walking in the middle of the city, and there is no uh, security around synagogues. There is no violence. I mean, they're idiots, as usual. But there's no pressure, and when I ask Ukrainians, like, what happened? And they say, like, what do you mean what happened? We don't care, you know, if you support Ukraine, I don't care who you are, you're Crimean Tatarian, or you're Russian, or you're Ukrainian, you're Belarusian, you're Polish, doesn't matter, Jewish. Because for us, that's what Mr. Grushevsky, pres first president of Ukraine said, he said, blood doesn't define the patriot, it's what you do for Ukraine. Turn around to Russia, now you see the difference. There is a world, there is something called the Russian world theory. Basically saying, you know, there is something, wherever Russian speaking people live, that's the Russian world. And it has to be protected. If necessary, by power. If necessary, by law. Well, sometimes you have to kill people too, but that's okay. But what's interestingly enough, how do you think, how many nations live in Russia? More than 300 different nations. Okay. They all definitely speak Russian language, but that's not their native language, okay? Most of the medals in Olympic Games for Russia were made by non-Russians. Every name you know from, any, any, any support of wrestling or, uh, you know, what is it, MMA, whatever it is, right? Anybody knows what that is, right? The mixed martial art, all of these boxers and, and famous medals, they're all from Caucasus region. They're not Russians, okay? Remember there was uh, the Russian tennisist, uh, her name was Kurnikova? Remember her? Guess what? She's Ukrainian. Do you know Maria Sharapova? She's Tatarian. <laughs> so, it's a very complex, and they know that. But, inside of Russia, the Russians are the older brother. And they can basically use any derogatory terms towards the non-Russian populations, what they want. And you know, one thing is on the streets, another thing is in literature, TV, music, and all of that stuff. It's a norm. I was in the Soviet Union army for two years. And I can, you know, prove you that that is the case. It was norm. It was not norm in Ukraine. And if you try to actually ask questions like, well, why, why everything should be Russian? They're going to tell you, are you Russophobe? You, don't, you hate Russians. If somebody said, I don't want to perform Tchaikovsky today, they're going to say, you are a Russophobe. You don't, you hate Russians. You don't understand, okay? That is the problem. We, in, uh, in the Ukrainian culture, it's more about building Ukraine, not, not interfering with somebody else, you know? 
That's the difference. It's a big difference. Another big difference, this is just a joke, but it's a serious one. This is the, villa, the picture of the Russian, uh, Russian house from the traveling site, which inviting people to visit Russia. It's not a joke. You can find it. And these are two Ukrainian, villa, uh, Ukrainian houses on sale in the real estate. No, just, just this is a contrast. Okay? A little bit. You can see it. We can discuss it later. But what's the big one? is woman's role in the family. The traditional Russian system was built in 16th century by the famous book called Domostroy, which basically says that, the phrases from Domostroy I just put there. You know, which means let wife to be afraid of her husband. Okay? Or, uh, which means if he husband beats up his wife, you know, he loves her. And you know what? You think that's crazy. That's probably 16th century, right? Guess what? In 21st century in Russia today, domestic violence is not a criminal offense. And guess what? They, when they see how the Ukrainians treat the women, in Ukrainian culture, the woman is Berehinya, which means she is a protector and the keeper of the family. We have to respect her. Any, condemn, any violence for a woman is condemned, you know? It's considered a dishonor if a man hits a woman or swears in front of the woman until today. Okay? Even now, women right now are fighting the fight, but still the case. Uh, and from the Ukrainian traditional teachings, the wife has to respect the husband and husband as to respect the wife no, matter, no less than himself. And that came from all traditions in Ukraine. In Ukraine, woman is the most important thing, the most important person in the household. And for me, that's the most important person in the whole audience. Thank you very much. Okay, this is a little bit, I'm not gonna go through that a lot. This is historical facts, uh, how what happened, you know, in 1991 to 2013, Important thing is 1994 Budapest Memorandum. Basically, the Western country said, Ukraine, you have nuclear weapons, you have missiles. We don't trust you, but we trust Russia because Yeltsin, who is always sober, you know that, uh, he will take care of it. So Ukrainians said, all right, you know what, we don't need it. We are people who would like to live in peace, who would like to have our land, we're beautiful. We don't need this, but can you guarantee that nobody ever will use those weapons against us? The answer was, oh, absolutely we will guarantee you that. You know that almost 50% of all the rockets that are flying to Ukraine today were made in Ukraine and were in Ukraine before the war. I will just leave it there. We will discuss, if somebody wants to go through the history separately, I, that's not the part of my talk, but we can go through this through the dates. We just don't want to spend a lot of time, okay? And this is where the country current uh, war is going to go on. If anybody has questions about the details, the red dots, that's where the fighting is happening right now. As you see, Russia took away the whole territory that are connecting Crimea to Russia, tried to make sure that they can do it on land. Again, that's a kind of a, not the part of my discussion, but this is the current situation. So, we discussed the roots, you understand what's going on. Later we will have a quiz. Okay, so please be ready. All right, basic information on Ukraine, and we're gonna go for another 10 minutes, and then we're gonna ask open for questions, okay? All right, let's move on. First of all, this is what I want you to remember. Three things, just three. First, Ukrainian has a long history of statehood. It's not Lenin who started it, trust me. <laughs> the, the map you saw was from 1648, all right? So, that's number one. Number two, Ukraine is a truly European nation, and it was always in the middle of all significant events in the European history including both World War I and World War II. Not only because the war happened at Ukrainian, on Ukrainian territory, but because of importance for Ukraine, of Ukraine as a part of either Russian Empire or Austro-Hungarian Empire or Poland, depends. Again, I'm not gonna go in details much more about this. Timothy Snyder, but we'll give you some links, is the best source. He has a whole lecture on that, <laughs> okay? And finally, the third one, which is a huge misconception, and you have to understand that. Ukraine was never a friend or ally of Russian Empire at any stage of history. 
or it was occupation. Because in 1648, Ukraine made it, but that time a smart decision of allying with the Moscovite Tsarstvo, which was not a Russian empire at that time, was a little smaller, let's say, to fight against Poles. Because Poland at that time was doing not good things on the territory of Ukraine. And when, when Moscovites, and we in Ukraine right now even discuss the question about should we call Russian Moscovites, you know, came to Ukraine, they saw how beautiful Ukraine is, and they say, we love it here. <laughs> We don't want to go home. And by the way, we have much more weapons than you. And Ukrainians from that moment realized, uh oh, we just invited a fox into what? Exactly. So we're trying to get up this fox for like, what, 300 something years, right? <laughs> and at a certain point, we decided that we we're already out of it, but unfortunately, not the case. So, again, Ukrainian history, important things. The first people lived on territory of Ukraine, look at the dates. It's 4800 before Christ. That's an official information about Tripilia culture. Okay, the Russian called Tripolia, in Ukrainian Tripilia. Okay, Kiev was established by the, uh, you know, what we call Vikings now, right? <laughs> in 482 AD. The Russians are telling us, oh, you know, the Vikings brought that, the Tateshood. But excuse me if people will live before that, right? Again, Timothy Snyder, you can read more about it. Then I was talking about 1654, Periastal Treaty, which gave Moscow rights. And then a little bit of details in 1918, when uh, Lenin allowed other countries to be part of the separate country, Ukraine was one of the first who said, we want to be independent. What we didn't know at that time is like in every other places, ask people from Finland, by the way, about that. The, the, the Soviet, the communists, created a little enclave when they put their people in, who turned around and said, no, 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 we don't want to be independent Ukraine. We want to be part of the former Russian empire called now Soviet, well, at that time it was not Soviet Union. It was a Soviet Russia. That's what the name of it. And you know who else did it? People in Finland, people in Poland, people in Baltic republics. Everywhere Russia tried that. They succeeded in Ukraine because, unfortunately, it was the biggest price, and that's what they went for. Finland had the civil war for, I don't remember, a year or two or something like that. A lot of people died. You can, as again, talk to people from Finland. They will tell you. That's why Finland, when I was in Finland in 2015 and 16, they had military exercises for civilians after Russia kept Crimea and the, the Luhansk area. Okay? So... Uh, there was a huge in a resistance of UPA, which is Ukrainian Independent Army, against Nazi and the Soviet regime during the World War II. In 1972-73 was mass arrests of people who, some of them we know and they're friends and relatives of my wife's family, arrested, you know for what? For what? The revolt? No. They were reading, their crime was in that, were reading and writing in Ukrainian. That was their crime. Think about it. In Ukrainian Republic, when officially Ukrainian language, you have TV, radio stations, newspapers, right? People were arrested for writing and speaking Ukrainian. Isn't that crazy? But that was norm, because guess what? Now you know, four principles. If Ukraine decided to get separated and said, oh, we're occupied, not good. Right? We don't want to lose you. Otherwise, we're going to kill you. You know, you already know. Okay, and finally, on August 1991, Ukraine became an independent. Now, this is a little bit of geography, of really, of Ukraine. Ukraine geography is very interesting. We have everything. We have around 10 or 11 climate zones. We're talking about mountains, talking about seas, we're talking about lower places, we're talking about, you know, uh, real big woods. By the way, one of the reasons why Russian uh, uh, offense did not work against Kiev because there were a lot of woods there. And you know what? Tanks are not that great in the wood. I don't know why, but you know, that's what it is. As you see, Crimea is in the south, Sea of Azov, completely occupied right now by Russians. Again, we're going to go about Ukrainian geography, we can talk, but this is a map for just giving you an idea. Uh, now I want you to learn one Ukrainian word. One. Actually, I'm going to look one. That's the most important one. Can you say Zemlya? Zemlya, yes, at the end, Zemlya. This word in Ukrainian language means four 
words in English. It could be earth, it could be soil, it could be ground, and it could be dirt. Dirt in terms of like, you know, your good dirt to grow stuff on. You can translate it, but the feeling of the word, the energy of the word is not the same. We have a lot of sayings in Ukrainians, which can be basically multi multiplied by four. Because each of those words you can use by substituting it the word zemlya. That's why instead of putting this thing, I put zemlya at the beginning of every phrase. And you can just imagine and check which word you like the most. But they all work and all fit, which is interesting. So zemlya is a holy, it's a sacred place for Ukrainian. Absolutely sacred. This is what she feels and hears and it's she. <laughs> feels, it's like mother, right? Feels, hears and knows everything. We have a word called Sveta Zemlya, which can be translated again as holy, sacred, blessed. Now we have, as a mathematician, 12 different combinations. Try one, see which one you like the most, and you can use it. So, and other things about Zemlya. Gives birth to the food, so food is a God's gift. This is what we're saying. That keeps the seal of confession. As you know, in, the Catholic, in, the, in any uh, Christian tradition, you have to confess to a priest. Guess what? If there is no priest, you can confess to Zemlya. And it will keep the seal of confession with you. It's a subject of swearing, meaning if I swear on something, I can swear on Zemlya. In Ukraine, that's what did it a lot. Zemlya was used as am amulet, which means when you go away, you take the little bit of a bag and put your you know, Zemlya inside. And wherever you are, you keep it there. One of the ideas, if, if you die, at least some of the some of the zemlya, which will be in the ground with your grave, comes from your land. Uh, zemlya does not belong to people. People belong to zemlya. This is not what I'm saying. This is the old Ukrainian saying. Okay? Try to find it in Russian language. Now it will be fun. Okay. Uh, people will share the fate of zemlya. That's another interesting thing. Traditions are, Ukrainians are incredibly careful with foods. Don't throw away food in front of Ukrainians. They're going to kill you. Because Ukraine, from 20, 1923 to 1933, has the Holodomor, which more than 10 million people died. We have special feelings about food, about earth, about zemlya in general. Another great phrase, which I like a lot, in addition to, you know, is one who sits on zemlya will not fall down. If you sit on the ground, you're not going to fall down, right? So you feel the power. Okay, so looks like my half an hour is up. Uh, as an announcement, for the next, next session, is going to be next Sunday, we will talk about Ukrainians in the United States. I'm just going to leave you with the slide. And I would like to present to you one more thing. We have here a calendar, which was built and made by Natalia, my wife, using actual paintings, pictures of paintings, of our friends, Natalia and Tatiana Kolechka. Tatiana Sergei Natalia, I'm saying Natalia all the time. You know why. So, Tatiana and Sergei Kolechka. And each of the page has Ukrainian name of the months, English name of the months, Ukrainian name of the day, English name of the day, some American and some Ukrainian home. So, what we're doing with this? Why we're doing this? Well, you probably guess. We want our friends in Ukraine who are in arts to have money to do more of the beautiful work, to do more of working with children that they will appreciate. Even with this horrible time of war, they can appreciate that there is art, there is beauty. And uh, I would say there is a long time tradition in Ukraine to actually do that. Sorry. So please, if somebody wants to get the calendar, we have them right over there. One of the pages actually has a portrait of Albert Einstein. You say like, well, that's interesting. And why it has a Brandeis crest on it? Hmm. The portrait was presented by us, the Brandeis University, last year to, I, guess what department? No. No, come on, that was rude, no. No. Physics, thank you very much, you won the prize, right? Yes, 
If someone wants to see this portrait of the person, it actually does lie in the hall, entry hall, of the physics department of Brandeis University. Okay, so thank you very much for your attention. I hope I didn't bore you much, right? I really, really, really looking for your questions, and I'm going to invite my wife also on the podium. So we can, yes, so we can both answer any of the questions you have, and I'm going to switch to my walking microphone. Thank you very much, and thank you everybody online. Okay. All right. Okay. No, no, no. That's fine. Anybody questions? <laughs> Hi, I'm Abby Hafer, and I was just hoping you could quickly go over that thing about nukes one more time because I didn't quite understand it. Oh. I'd like to get that timeline correct, if you would, please. Okay. Okay. So, going back in history, 1991, Soviet Union collapsed because three people who were leaders at that time of the Communist Party and three republics. Okay, you hear me, right? Leaders of the communist parties decided to split the country. Because guess what? You know, they like to rule themselves. <laughs> and uh, the world traditionally has two powers, the United States and the Soviet Union. Do you remember who was the president of the United States in 1993? Mr. William. Okay, so he gave it from the, George w, from the George Bush, the old one. The old George Bush didn't even understand why Ukraine needed to exist. He was like, why do you want to split the Soviet Union? It's such a beautiful place. You just replace communists and everything's going to be hunky-dory. Like in America, you have 50 states. What's the problem, right? Oh, we forgot to tell you that we have an older... Can you imagine if New York would be an older brother to everybody else? That would be interesting, right? Okay, so, you know, nobody said the Yankee sucks. I don't know. Surprise. I'm like... Look, looks like I'm not in Boston. Anyway, so, um, so the Clinton, who became an ex-president, he was definitely not interested a lot outside of Israel. That's what his idea. So, you know, according to the certain movie, Mr. Orloff was flying there and buying weapons. Did you watch that movie? No? Yeah, you have to check it out. There's a movie about the guy who's named Boot, right? He was recently in prison in the United States. Anyway, he said, like, it's corruption, horrible. Let's play it one place. Two corruptions we can't handle. We need one corruption in Russia. That's fine. So Clinton said, all right, let's do that. So they went to Russia, Ukrainian, and then that president, Kravchuk at that time, was like, okay, you know, not a problem. We can do that. But Ukraine needs guarantees that nobody will attack us with the weapons we have. So wait, so the weapons were in Ukraine? Correct, yes. Because during the Soviet time, weapons were everywhere, including Ukraine. Ukraine has a lot of the weapons, really a lot. And the... And it was a third place at that time of nuclear weapons after this, the United States and Russia. China was not even in the picture at that time. Okay, so Ukraine had weapons from the Soviet Union. That's kind of a, you know, got them from the Soviet Union. Also, Ukraine has several military factories who were doing stuff for the military. Like in Dnipro, Dnipropetrovsk, the famous Yuzhmash. This is a famous uh, factory which did all of the engines for every ballistic rocket Soviet Union had ballistic missiles. So anyway, they came up and, and say like, okay, we need to do something about it. So uh, Clinton started talking to Yeltsin and Kravchuk and say, well, we probably can, can get rid of those weapons. And if missiles, we will transfer to Russia, but nuclear weapons we have to destroy. Okay, so they were thinking about it, thinking about it, and finally they reached my friend and classmate, almost a year younger, a mathematician, physicist actually, from uh, Ukraine called Pavlo Klimkin, who you know as a medicine of foreign affairs of Ukraine under the President Poroshenko. That's how the nuclear physicist Pavlo Klimkin, uh, we had some fun at uh, you know, high school time, became the figure in the politics. Because he was the only person who actually knew what nuclear weapons are. <laughs> and how to, dis how to dismember them and put them together and whatever. Nobody at that time was thinking what's going to happen next. Clinton was busy, you know, he has, uh, you know, Middle East talk issues. 
Uh, so they said, like, okay, let's do it. In Budapest, of all the places, and by the way, you probably know that today Budapest for Ukrainians is not a happy place, right? <laughs> because Mr. Orban is, how to say that, not a friend of Ukraine. Uh, but Budapest agreements, they came to Budapest and said, we, United States, Great Britain, uh, Germany, France, Russian Federation, will guarantee Ukraine that nobody will touch their borders. Nobody will ever attack Ukraine, right, on the territory of Ukraine, or even discuss the question of legitimacy of Ukraine, because the story with Crimea, we're going to discuss it a little bit later, but, you know, this is what it is. So take us your weapons, and we'll be fine. We're going to be friends. So in 1994, the agreement was signed, and the next year, all the, all the nuclear weapons from Ukraine were removed. Do you know the name of that agreement? It's called Budapest Agreement, Budapest Treaty, yes. The Budapest Memorandum, sorry, yes, you're right. Budapest Memorandum, after the city of Budapest, the capital of Hungary, you probably heard about that. Yes, and, and I'm not gonna say that Hungary is the people who, but unfortunately, the current leadership of Hungary has a lot of you know, ties with Russia related to the gas line which goes through Hungary. They're making money out of it. And also, there is a part of Ukraine called Zakarpatia, which has a very serious Hungarian population, and some of the Hungarian not good people thinking that maybe it should be Hungary. Anyway, thank you for the question. Any other questions? Can you comment on... I want to get the white to the people so we can all just Sorry. Thank you. Can you comment on the status of the Crimea and the relationship in, between Ukraine and Russia regarding that? Mm -hmm. So the Crimea is a long story. If you listen to Timothy Snyder, He's going to tell you the truth, saying Crimea, originally, way back, traditionally, is the territory of Tartars, of Crimean Tartars. That's their land. Okay? So the uh, Russian Empire occupied that land way back in the 19th century. By the way, funny part is that in the 17th century, Russia still paid money to the king of Crimea, because officially the, the Crimea was a sovereign of Russia. Interesting, right? Yes, that's true. You can take a look. <laughs> they paid, they still paid money. And when the Crimean king come to Russia, the Russian king should walk next to his horse as the sovereign. Because the sovereign is on the king. Do you think that before the war that's going on there now is over, that the, the Ukrainians will demand that Crimea be brought back? Okay. Let's talk about like steps by step, right? So Crimea was a part of the Russian Empire. Okay? When the Soviet Union showed up as a country, right, Crimea was a part of the Russian Federation. Until, but, little detail, Krasnodar and the other side of the, uh, of the Black Sea, which is a very great soil and everything else, that was part of Ukraine. So Khrushchev, and think about geographically, I don't want to have a map, but basically, you, Crimea, has only uh, the, by the land you can go to Ukraine, right? The uh, Krasnodar was connected to Ukraine through the Azov Sea, through the famous city of Mariupol, like you know, right? All of that was Ukraine. So Khrushchev, from absolutely practical reasons, said, how about we're gonna change it? The Ukraine will do the Crimea, and Russia will get the Krasnodar, okay? That was a swap for the powers. Now, people, well, interesting. Before the revolution, there was a kind of a, a, a census. And guess who was the majority of Crimean population? Ukrainians. You would be surprised, not Crimean Tatars, Ukrainians. Okay? What happened later is the famous tragedy of Tatarian people. In, in 1944, you can probably saw, there is a movie called Kaftarma, you can just actually see it in English. Stalin decided to remove all of the Tartars out of Crimea into Siberia. I'm not going to discuss how many of them died, but... And guess who was substituting the Tartars over there? You know who? The Gulag guards and officers. It was, remember like in Roman time, if you fight really well and you're in the military, they give you land. Same thing the Soviets did to the loyal uh, butchers of Gulag. My uh, father had a friend 
from Theodosia, which is the city of Crimea. Who grew up, he grew up there, Ukrainian. And he said all of his neighbors were former guards and butchers of Gulag. <laughs> that was like a premium. That's why by the time of, uh, you know, swap, a lot of population were put there, were Russians. Right? So that is the story of Crimea. Then, no, at that time, nobody thought that Ukraine would ever going to be independent, right? So when Ukraine became independent, the question of Crimea was very serious. It was discussed at the beginning of the 90s. There was several revolts there. There was agreement with the... But Ukrainian decided to bring Tartars back. Actually, Gorbachev started it, right? But the Ukrainians continued. But the local population, who were relatives and grandsons and sons of... And even some of them were still Gulag people. They really don't like that idea, right? So they say, we're not going to allow that to happen, and that's why we want to be a part of Russia. Again, a small population of territory. But Russia always wanted Crimea back. And the reason for that is strategic. It's a beautiful strategic place. By the way, only 10% of Crimea is beautiful. The rest, 90 is kind of, you know, not that beautiful. You can look at the maps. It's a very soiled, it's a lot of salt in the ground. It's, it's, it's a deserted area. But what we call the Yubeka, the southern, southern, southern uh, you know, part of Crimea, that's beautiful. Okay? So this is why Russia wanted it. It's a beautiful place. Why not? And 2014, they were used it. And by the way, it's not started in 2014. It started way before. For example, this, in Sevastopol, the Russian fleet was for all this time because of agreement with Ukrainian power. Ukraine said, okay, you know, you have a fleet in Sevastopol, that's okay. The President Yanukovych, who was kicked out in 2014 of power, made an agreement with Russia for, what, 99 years, right? Something like that. And they were preparing for giving Crimea back to Russia. But if you go to Crimea in 2013, you would be surprised to know that almost every bank belonged to Russians. Every big factory belonged to Russians. Every big hotel chain belonged to Russians. 50% of all the properties in Crimea was bought by Russians because, yes, they had money, right? And the Ukrainians who were worked there, they were, how to say, corrupt a little bit, <laughs> you know? By the way, part of the Berkut who was killing us in, in, in 2014, on, on 2013, 2014, were from Crimea. So it's a very tough question. If we try to go historically, it's really hard to question. In my opinion, we have to ask Crimean Tartars. And Crimean Tartars said, 100%, we will stay with Ukraine. If you ask Mr. Jamilev, who is the leader of Crimean Tartars, who is right now, is it in the US? I don't remember where he is right now. But, you know, he's a leader of Tartars. Jamilev, his last name. Uh, he was specifically said that 2014 is the third historical tragedy for Tatarian people. And that's the answer to the question. Plus, yes, a little bit of a Budapest memorandum, which says, like, Crimea is Ukraine, don't touch it. Okay? So I expect a lot of negotiations, discussions about that. But you know who's going to be the main player? I'm not Amsterdamus, but I can predict Turkey. Why? Because Tartars and Turks are relatives. And Turkey is a huge power in the region. Another thing what Tur Tur Turkey did really well. Have you ever been in Antalya or any other resort areas in Turkey? Anybody? Raise your hand. Isn't that beautiful there? They want to do the same in Crimea. So Turkey is very interested about that. And Turkey is, as you know, on the side of NATO, on the side of Ukraine. So that, this, watch out. This player, this player will make a difference and tilt the wage in a specific way. That's what I meant. That's what I think. Thank you for the question. Anybody else? Any other questions? Just let me know and I'll... Yeah, go ahead. One minute, please. Give your hand. Okay. Thank you very much. We'll come back. Thank you very much. Could you talk about the causes uh, of the Gladomor, of the famine in the 1930s in Ukraine? Okay. Um, Sure. Uh, as you probably know, um, Stalin's idea of being a dictator right, was, kind of say, interfered 
was Ukrainians who somehow wanted to be free farmers. I don't know how that happened, but you know. So Stalin said, we have to somehow destroy that. Ukraine, and we're going to talk about that next week. Ukraine has more than 200 revolts against the Soviet Union from 1922 to 1939. Okay? And guess where all of those revolts happened? In the land of agriculture. Ukraine, breadbasket of the Europe of the world. So how to break the spirits of Ukrainians? Well, starve them to death. The reason for the Holodomor was to destroy the people who can be on the way of, you know, the Soviet Union and all the brother and, you know, Ukrainian, who wants an Ukrainian independence somehow, or they want to be independent from the government. That's not good for Stalin. Okay, that is the cause. How it was done is a complete diabolical way. Because a lot of people who were in charge of Holodomor were Ukrainians. That is terrible, but it's true. And what they did, they put the military in, and just basically what they were, they were waiting for the harvest in 1932. And when people got the harvest, the military came and took every piece of grain, every small little grain out of these people. And they were not allowed to leave their villages because any people in those villages did not even have passports. When they came to city, they were arrested by the, by the police and sent back. Okay? So now you have no food, you can't leave, and you're surrounded by the military. You understand the result. And again, the reason for that, we we'll discussed that, those four things. Somebody who wants to be not part of the regime, agree with the regime, and be an independent, well, we love you so much, we're going to kill you. Anybody else? Um, I, I used to work for the law school at Harvard before I retired. And I think, oh, somewhere back, uh, out, right after Ukraine became a republic again, there was a, a, a group of people who came to the law school to get a constitution that apparently had been left uh, uh, in sa for safekeeping in this country. Uh, could you, if you have any knowledge of what that was about, could you explain? <laughs> Honestly, I just know the parts of those stories. We have to probably come back to you with the correct answer. But, the, but maybe some of my Ukrainian friends can know the story. What I know about the Constitution of Ukraine is that the Constitution of Ukraine was created way back during the Ukraine, Ukraine People's Republic in 1918. It was a lot of those paragraphs came back from all the Cossacks' times. Because you have to remember that democracy in Ukraine did not start in 1918. The Cossack state was the first, you know, democratic, people were elected there, which was a good thing and a bad thing at the same time, right? So a lot of paragraphs come from there, but connection to the United States, we're gonna talk about that next week. Yes, yes, the leaders of Ukraine were researching American constitution. And they were looking for America as the beacon of freedom, as an example of how to create. If you think about it, Ukrainian structure is very similar to American because Ukrainians started from the bottom, going up. Little villages, little groups, little communities commun who are giving away power to the top. Okay, that's why probably United States was the best place. But I'll find out the details. Thank you very much for your question. Anybody else? Don't be shy. <laughs> Don't be shy, yeah. Excuse me. Hello. Thank you. What do you think of the present tendency to escalate the war with the weapons that are being directed over there to the Ukrainians, such as the Abraham tanks and the tanks from Germany? Do you think that an over-escalation will lead to a more beneficial outcome or actually a worse outcome? Well, uh, let's, yeah, thank you for the question, first of all. I think it's on the bottom minds of people. Why and what's going on? We will more discuss it next week. But let me give you an answer. If Ukrainians don't have weapons, they will use bare hands to kill Russians. 
It doesn't matter if weapons come or not, Ukrainians will not give up. Only it will cost us more lives. So weapons helping saving our lives, Ukrainian lives. Escalation of the conflict, that's, uh, it's already escalated to the level. Like there is no more red lines left. Sorry, Mr. Kerry. You know what I'm talking about, right? Some people heard that Kerry said red lines was serious. Yeah. So uh, weapons are helping to save our lives. That's it. Es escalation already over. It can be ex nuclear weapons. If you ask about if Russia want to use nuclear weapons, if Americans send tanks, no, they will not. Because if they would, they already did. You remember all of those movies you watch with gangster and bad people? And the gangster bring the guy and said, like, I'm going to kill you. He said, like, if you kill, you already killed me before, right? You brought me in because you need something from me, right? Same thing. There is a joke which I'm going to tell you, which was very popular in Russia, uh, you know, before the war and in Ukraine. The Russian government, which hated America for a long time, right, you know, got together and said, we're going to bomb America. Like, we're going to bomb America with nuclear weapons. We're going to start with, oh, let's start with New York. One guy resembles that, eh, nyeh, nyeh, New York, no good. My wife is shopping right now over there. <laughs> and the other said, oh, let's do Washington. And I said, no, 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 my daughter is studying at Georgetown. Not a good idea. <laughs> How about LA? Let's, let, the Hollywood is like a whole, you know, all of this devil living there. Like, mm, we have houses there. Not good, you know. So they decided to bomb Voronezh, which is a Russian city. <laughs> okay? You have to remember that with all the sanctions, the interest of Russian oligarchy, whatever you're going to call it, in the United States and the West is still huge, right? If you look at where, where are the daughters and sons of the leaders of Russia, I can tell you where they're not. They're not in Russia, <laughs> okay? You know, and, and it's very nice to be a friend of Russia and support Russia when you're in America and you're paid a lot of dollars to play for Washington Capitals. Any, any hockey fans? Ovi? 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 Mr. Ovechkin? Do you know he was official representative of Putin during the last election? And by the way, Mr. Malkin from Pittsburgh Penguins too. And Maria Sharapova who was recently finished the Harvard Business School. So, what I'm saying is not, you know, it's their choices. Whatever they do, you know, they're going to tell you. None of them, by the way, condemn the war, interestingly enough. Uh, they're walking away from the question. Um, but what I'm saying is the financial interest of the Russian oligarchy in the United States and the West is so big, that they're not going to destroy this country, no, no. Okay? What they use, their bullies, they're using us here, United States people, to bully and say like, oh, try to do that, we're gonna kill you. You know, now, when Zaporozhye and Kherson, it's officially Russia, so any military attack on those areas will be a response up to nuclear weapons. You know what? We're fighting from that time, what, there's like a five months already? I haven't seen it yet. And by the way, thinking about how dictatorship, Russian leadership is, do you know why the war started on February 24th, specifically? Anybody? Anybody? Any, any people who watch Olympic Games? Okay, so when was the last, the, the closing ceremony of Olympic Games in Beijing? Correct. And 23rd is official holiday in Russia of what? Of a military services. That's why they were drunk, so you can start. But, Putin wanted to start earlier, but Mr. Chi, nice guy, call him up and say, you sit down on your hands until the Olympic Games are over. Do you think Stalin would, for example, take a guess from, I don't know, the President of the United States say, oh guys, we just have a World Series over here, you know, until we finish, just don't, don't attack. So that's, that shows you the difference between the different leaders. So in my opinion, United States and we should give Ukraine as much weapons as we can. We should control the training of people. We should make sure they have enough resources. And we definitely need to be in the boardroom when they decide what to do with it, which is actually happening right now. Friends of King Kiev, or whatever was in Kiev, told me that so many American and British soldiers, I mean, military there, 
they're all involved. There is no such thing as giving money. And by the way, interestingly enough, a lot of people saying, oh, wow, we're spending so much money on Ukraine. You know what? Most of those money stay here. <laughs> it's actually create jobs, right? Interesting. Anyway, did I answer a question? Thank you. Next. Oh, sorry. I like it. May I ask Hi, <laughs> Vlad. Thank you very much. Um, and I think it's being of Ukrainian ancestry important that we hear your stories and your perspective. Um, and I had the privilege to listen to Amb Ambassador um, Yanovich speak last week at Harvard, and she it really stressed the importance and the impact um, if Ukraine were to lose the impact on the world. And. Perhaps you understand better than I, who <laughs> wasn't born in, 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 in Ukraine, what the, what you, and I'd like to hear what you think the impact of a loss would be. For example, the emboldenment of other dictators right. and, and, and whatnot. Okay. But from a personal perspective, how can we help the Americas better understand the importance of this victory? Thank you. Uh, so, and then I have a part mm -hmm. B, just to answer a question. Good. My mother was a survivor of the um, uh, Stalin-induced famine, and I highly recommend a movie called um, Mr. Jones that was released in 2020. That was a really neat, it, from my perspective, it sort of resonated the stories I heard from my mom. So, um, if that's of interest. But back Thank to you. the question. So, <laughs> this is a great question because it's an announcement for next week. Because that's the whole thing we're going to discuss next week. Ukraine, America, why, and what was going on. Okay. And thank you for your question. <laughs> you have, I have to, I, you see, you know, I have a help right here. You know, good one. So, uh, basically, we're going to talk about this, right? Big, short answer is that United States always stand behind the people who are in trouble from dictators. We always support it. The struggle and this is why we have to stay there because if the United States will not do that then the rest of the world just say ha hmm, you know long time ago United States wasn't that and now it's not anymore and that is a big problem so but more details and more information will come next time yeah other questions please thank you may I ask a question from the uh, home audience mm -hmm. um, let me see if I can read this. Uh, is it correct that one of the reasons of Russian invasion was that Ukraine is rich in minerals, especially lithium? There, what? That, that, uh, uh, that Ukraine is rich in minerals, especially lithium. Minerals. Oh, minerals. Oh, well. I mean, well, uh, yes and no. Uh, in my opinion, mit mi minerals are bonus. The most important thing is think about it. 40 million hardworking people, right, would like to stray away from you. Not good. Minerals is good, but people are much more important. People is the biggest capital of Ukraine. We, uh, and we're going to again talk about that next week, more about the human capital of Ukraine. As a human factor, IT security specialist, I can tell you that there is nothing more important than protecting the human life and the human being and the human security, right? And when it comes to the war, the, always the goal of the war right now is not, a long time ago was territory, minerals, whatever. Today is influence. Influence on people's minds. Okay? The same way the Russian influenced the people's minds during the elections in the United States. Watch out for 2024, by the way. Uh, yeah, the same way they influenced, again, influenced. I didn't say they decided, influenced. The same way the victory in Ukraine would influence the mind of the rest of the people in the world about what they think and what kind of line the world and will take a what position what will take on those relationships that's what they're fighting for thank you any other questions 
Actually, I had a question. Sure. Um, I think in light of what you've described as the mindset of Russia, and I think I understand it, but one thing that's always been strange to me is that during the invasion, Russian forces are destroying the infrastructure that basically could help re help the Russians, you know, the factories, utilities. Can you speak to that at all? Sure. I'll give you two examples which explain that. Okay, example number one. Uh, it is terrible to say, but most of the territories the Russians are destroying were populated by people who were speaking mostly Russian language at home. I'm not saying they're Russians, but they were speaking the Russian language. We, next week we're going to more discuss about why, but they did. Okay? Why? Why Kharkiv is destroyed? Kharkiv was a Russian-speaking city, right? Why Kramatorsk is destroyed right now? Why uh, Vuglidar and all those places? Here's an answer for you. There is a phrase in Russian language, which exists only in Russian language. Bey svayich, shtob chujiye bayalis. Beat the hell out of your own people, so the other people look at this thing and be afraid. That's one answer for you. The answer for you, number two, coming from the classical Russian literature, and there is a famous piece by Ostrovsky. Okay, there is a famous uh, writer, Russian playwright. His name is Ostrovsky. You can find it. Uh, there was a famous piece of him out of which you know movie was made and the piece was made. Basically, the idea is like this: there was a lady. The guys tried to get the lady. She doesn't like him. He tried again. He doesn't like him again. He refused, so he took the gun and shot her dead. But it's not what he should or did, but what he said before he should show that. He said, in Russian, and I'll translate, не достанешься мне, так не доставайся никому. If you will not be mine, then you will not belong to anybody else. Boom. So this is the reason why everything is destroyed, right? Because that's it, you know. Um, yeah, and by the way, one thing I want to tell you that uh, about atrocities and everything else, when, when you guys in America, when you say Russians, remember, uh, most of the militaries who were sent to, especially in the northern part of Ukraine, were not Russians. They were Burets, they were Tatars, they were Chechens, they were many, many, many nationalities, Dagestans. Why? Because that's what Russia loved to do. When I was in the military service, I was the lucky one. I was in Ukraine. But you know what percent? We had like 300 people in my kind of quarters. Do you know how many Ukrainians we had? Six. The others came from Middle Asia, like Middle, e Middle Asia, like Central Asia, like Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, you know, Caucasus regions, Azerbaijan. If you go to military service at that military headquarters in Azerbaijan, you will not find Azerbaijanis. You will find Ukrainians, Russians, things like that. Why? Because the militaries, by default, were created not to fight Americans, but to squash any appraisal on the local level. That's why they didn't have locals. Thank you. Um, so, is, uh, can you give us uh, the names of some trusted uh, Trusted uh, 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 organizations mm -hmm. to donate to. Okay, announcement for next week. I'm going to put the full list of trusted organizations. One of the organizations we're discussing today is Maria, right? And we're going to give you a full list for the next. I'm just. I don't want to like spend a lot of time, but there are more than I would say in just Boston area, New England, where are more than 15 different organizations. I'm going to give you a very interesting examples. Uh, there is an organization in California called Nova Ukraine, Nova Ukraine, who just created the World Guinness record for collecting the number of generators to Ukraine in one month. <laughs> it's not a joke. They were able to collect more than 1,000 generators and ship them to Ukraine. This is what the peoples do. 
And I would say that a lot of people who got involved in these organizations are not necessarily Ukrainians. There are a lot of Americans and other nationalities. Yeah, any other questions? So we, next week, please. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Vlad. It's a great uh, presentation. Um, we're in a house of faith, and many of us have different faiths. But in this unique context of a house of faith, as we imagine that the way we might move past this conflict is by influencing the hearts and minds of people within Russia, is there a way that faith provides an answer to how we might influence people within Russia so that they see another way of looking at Ukraine rather than big brother, little brother, as you said? Very, very, very good question. Thank you very much for it, because this is what I was expecting. Here is an interesting story. Half of, here's my son sitting right over there, Bernie. His mother is originally from Russia, even though she's Jewish. His, half of his family lived in Moscow until 2022. His uncle was a very, and he is a very religious man. He's a Christian. He, he was uh, influenced by Alexander Main, that was a very famous preacher in, in, uh, in Moscow. And uh, as you can imagine, how horrified were they what happened. And I asked them the same question. I said, there is any way somehow we can start talking to people in Russia and tell them what's going on. And he said, right now, they're blind and deaf. What we need to do, we need to help to change the regime. But the Russians should do it by themselves. But the God's word, the praise word, always comes through the heaven to people who listen. I believe there are religious people in Russia. I believe there are people who are, do not want a war. By the way, their support to the war, what officially said, it's usually not support to the war. It's support of this great idea of Russian older brother. So yes, there are some people who can do that. But the answer historical is very simple. 1945, Germany. How many years it took for the West world to help Germans to be Germans today, not the Germans in 1945. Did it go through the pre preaching? Yes, it did. A lot of preachers came. You read the literature from Germany from those times, right? You've heard even speeches from Arnold Schwarzenegger, who was Austrian, not, not German, but the same thing. That it, but right now, at this moment, it's one of those episodes when we have to win, we have to get the victory. And yes, I strongly believe that the God word, you know, will come to people who will listen. Right now, they are so scared and they're so shut up, they, they, they can't hear, they can't see. But one day, I hope, God help us, they will. Because nothing more we as Ukrainians want is a democratic question next to us and not imperialistic question. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. One moment, please. So President Zelensky is, um, was the man standing there when this all happened. What do you think about him and his efforts? And was he the man for the job? Are you lucky to have him? Are you, is, I just wonder, we, okay. we hear a lot like, you know, he, yeah. he stood strong. Okay. So I wonder what you think. Thank you for a question. I really love questions about Zelensky. We, by the way, I'm gonna give you an interesting story. In Boston, we have a guy, which is a, a leader of a group called Center McCor, which is a Jewish, who was teaching him to perform on stage. Seriously, not a joke. No, I'm 100%. So, Zelensky is a fantastic actor. Like, world-class comedian and actor. Not only comedian, he's an actor. He was studied, even though he never studied acting as his career, he was a lawyer out of all. But he's a fantastic actor. And in times of the crisis, his biggest influence to Ukrainian situation is not to interfere with militaries. 
You know, his job is to be a speaker of Ukraine. His job is the guy who, like Kennedy, would like to say great phrases, which we'll remember for the rest of our life. He has a great speechwriter and he's a great actor. As the person, you know what, as for most of the actors, it doesn't really matter. Because it's a role he plays, what matters. Have you heard about the actor called Laurence Olivier? Yes. There's a joke, you know, when the, he comes and they, you know, for the joke when he comes to the queen. And the queen said, you know, I want today to have a Julius Caesar in my room. And he came and he's like, Julius Caesar and speaking. Next, he said, no, I want Napoleon. He came as Napoleon. And he came and then asked him like, um, is, and then a lot of the, I don't know, like, whatever. And then he came like, I want, this time, I want you to be performing like Lawrence Olivier. He's like, I'm sorry, Lawrence Olivier cannot perform. <laughs> okay? So, yeah, go ahead. We have one more question online. Mm -hmm. um, are there any uh, author, or geopolitical authors or books that predicted this that we can read to, to educate ourselves on likely outcomes? That's a great question. This presentation have a whole list of references. Uh, I would definitely recommend to listen to Timothy Snyder lectures. He has a whole bunch of books recommending. Uh, another great place to look, we have, um, uh, uh, there is, in Boston, we have a HURI, which is Harvard Univer uh, Ukrainian Research Institute. And it publishes many books. We also have uh, the whole Ukrainica, they call it, like uh, the website when you can, you can see it. We will bring more because we do know authors in Ukraine and we will definitely next time, we will bring some books to recommend you. And, uh, but yeah, some of the list I already have on the slides and you know, we'll share with you for sure. We'll take one more question. Hi, Vlad, I wonder if you could say a, a few words about the uh, student organization than they know about you. They, they talk about you when I talk to them uh, and, and their efforts and who they are and kind of why we should support them to the extent that we plan to. Okay. Thank you, great. Maria in Ukraine is dream. The second meaning of that word is that plane which was destroyed by Russians. It's also called Maria. Just imagine the war is going on in their country. The youngest, the brightest, thanks to Julia Lemesh, is one of the organizers of bringing people here, came to the United States to best of the best of the best colleges. We're talking about Brown, Harvard, MIT, Tufts, uh, what was that, uh, I don't remember Princeton, but eh, like best schools. As you understand, those schools will not just accept people because they're from Ukraine. They need to test. So these people came here to do three things. First, learn. Not only learn math or physics, but learn American society and American way of life. Because back in Ukraine, we know not only about sports and genes, you know, like a long time ago, we know about American democracy and we really, really cherish that relationship. Second thing, what they came here, they want to meet their classmates, the, the students of America, not only America, but also other countries, to create that bond which will bring them for the rest of their life. These people are leaders of the future, right? So if they have bonds, we have less chances of war, more chances of understanding each other. And the third one, why they came here, is to support their people at home. Just imagine you have to go through the hardest mathematical problems when you know that your parents sitting without electricity. It's hard. When the bombs are flying over their heads, a lot of people feel guilt that they're not under bombs like others. That's why supporting this organization is supporting the future. Again, we're going to talk about more next time, right? Announcement. So, but this is supporting the future. This, I, 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 I want to call them children, they're not children. <laughs> they're young adults. They have lights in their eyes. They have sparkles in their eyes. That's the people who want to build, not destroy. This is the people who want to 
make something good to the world and say, we are Ukrainians, but we're citizens of the world. And I think that's why we need to support them. Thank you very much. Just, just, uh, could, yeah. could uh, their name doesn't work in Wordle. Excuse me? The, the name of the organization is, is five letters, but I can't pronounce it, it's, and Wordle does not know about it. Okay, could, it's could you pronounce Mri their name? Okay. Can you say Mria? Mria, dream. Mria. Maria. That's it. Maria. It's like Maria, but without A. Maria. <laughs> okay? It's like when Boston would like to skip letters. So that's, that should work pretty well. So, one more thing I want to say before we close. I have a very special bracelet on my hand. This bracelet is made out of a metal of the last production from Azovstal. From Azovstal. That famous factory in Mariupol, which was kept by Ukrainian soldiers and heroes for so long against all the odds. This thing gives me so much strength and nothing else in the world. So I want you to feel the strength and to feel that this strength will be definitely directed towards the good, towards the restoring of our country, towards the future, a bright future for our kids and our adults and our everybody an absolutely great relationship with the United States. Thank you very much. Is this on, Bob? Okay. Yeah. Vlad, I want to thank you very much. Um, again, we're going to have a subsequent complimentary presentation next Sunday, again at one. And to remind people, if you wish to donate to that Mirya, um, there's a basket there. If you're interested in the calendars, I encourage you to look at the beautiful photographs of these, these presentation, these, uh, sorry, these pictures. Um, in order to offset the expense for production of the calendar and also give to Ukraine um, artists, uh, we're asking for 25 or 50, sorry, 25 or 30 dollars for each. So consider that if you're interested. Thank you very much for being here. We appreciate it and have a lovely afternoon. We're going to bring more good stuff next time. Okay. Seriously.